Hello folks and welcome back and in this lecture we will be tucking into Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. Uh, one of the great classics of comic studies. It's uh, really to my mind just a great book in and of itself. I think anybody could read this book and enjoy it and get something out of it. Even if you don't particularly like comics or comics aren't your thing, uh, I just think the questions that McLeod raises in this book and the sort of philosophical side of it is just really fascinating. Uh, again, even if this is not something that speaks to you right now, just give it a chance and I think you will be impressed and start to see why uh, McLeod is so famous. Again, not just in terms of uh, comic studies, but he's a, uh, a lot of people love this book, so let's just leave it at that. Uh, in this uh, lecture, we'll talk a little bit about comic studies. Yes, that is a thing. Uh, we will talk about McLeod, uh, how he talks about comics, some of the vocabulary, uh, some of the questions he raises, such as form and content. What is that all about? As well as how he defines comics. And then we'll get in a little bit to the into the history of comics. Uh, but first, I want to talk about your personal history with comics. Uh, let me just tell you, myself, I've been reading comics since I was old enough to read. I basically grew up on these things. Spider-Man, Incredible Hulk, uh, Batman, I mean, y you name it. Uh, any comic book was fine. I just, I loved, uh, any comic I could get my hands on, I, I wanted to have it. Um, and then throughout, you know, the rest of my life, I sort of went through phases of comics. Uh, uh, there's certain favorites, I guess, that, all, that always want to know what, what's going on. Uh, I really like the Frank Miller series, uh, Batman. Of course, I like uh, the Walking Dead comics. I like, uh, oh, what else? Batman still. Uh, but I really like uh, Conan comics. You know, I've always liked Conan. <laughs> uh, you know, I guess you just, everybody has certain uh, heroes or certain, um, I guess, characters that, that speak to them, and they just love uh, keeping up with the stories. Uh, and, of course, I like, nowadays, there's a lot of more sophisticated really just uh, literature in the form of uh, comics. And so there's really no shortage. I never get tired of reading comics. I think <laughs> you give me a choice between reading a regular book and, and reading a comic book. You know, I'll pick the comic book uh, nine times out of ten. Uh, you know, it's just it's just a medium I, I really enjoy. I'm really drawn to it. Uh, but what about you? Uh, are you like me? Are you kind of a lifelong comics fan? Uh, are you new to it? I'd just love to know what your experience has been like and uh, if you have any favorites. All right, so first, what is comic studies? Uh, what's that all about? And here is a picture of the one of the big figures, who, of course, is the author of our book, uh, Scott McCloud himself, and that picture is right here on the Wikipedia page, under Theorizing Comics. So obviously I'm not going to read this whole Wikipedia page to you, but it does a good job of laying out some of the different academic fields, conferences and journals, and, you know, the different schools, universities around the world, actually, where they're studying comics now. Uh, so you can actually make a living studying comics in a, <laughs> you know, as part of a university uh, curriculum. It's, it's pretty fantastic. I never would have thought this was possible even, you know, 10 years ago. But, but look at all of these... Uh, schools now offering programs in it. You can get an MA in comics, I guess, from, what is this, Teesside University. Uh, and we have uh, plenty of uh, colleagues here, or I have, uh, you know, several colleagues here that are actually way more into comics than I am. There's uh, Michael Dando, also in the English department, Bradley Chisholm over in film, and uh, uh, Christopher Lehman uh, from Ethnic and uh, Women's Studies, you know, here at St. Cloud State. And all of those uh, they do comics, they do uh, uh, animation as well, so cartoon movies, <laughs> animated features. <laughs> uh, so there's a, there's a lot to talk about and a lot of interest to the, in this. Uh, so if it is something, you know, if you take this class and you're like, wow, I really love, love comics, I'm really in, into this now, uh, there's lots of places you can go with that. Okay, with that aside, uh, let's get into McLeod then. Uh, so here he's talking about... Uh, comics as a medium and how the, uh, uh, the the medium and the message you see he's kind of playing around with this concept <laughs> uh, is important 
And he's, you might not be aware of this, but he's basing this language on a book uh, called uh, Marshall, or, uh, by Marshall McLuhan, uh, called The Medium is the Message. And he's got another one called The, well, the Medium is the Massage. Uh, and he's basing these ideas on that, basically what uh, McLuhan talks about in his book is how, uh, I think he was writing back in like the 50s and 60s, and a lot of people were saying, well, television is... It's, they called it the boob tube. It's like it makes you dumb watching too much TV. We still have some of that attitude, right? Uh, you know, TV shows are basically dumb, and there's not a lot to them. They're very simplistic. Uh, but McLuhan, now, he pointed out, well, that's not really the fault of the TV. Uh, you know, that's just the, the programming. <laughs> you know, there's no reason why a TV show uh, has to be unsophisticated and dumb. You know, you could have a very sophisticated television show uh, you know you, you, you want to think about what's on the TV over here and separate that from the TV itself which you know you could have you know 24-7 uh, French films or French cinema I guess you know whatever on, on the TV so that's the sort of idea don't conflate the two um, you know just because there's a lot of comics that are for kids and pretty silly and pretty uh, you know simplistic uh, that by no means implies that all comics are like that. There's something about the medium of comics, you know, the drawing and the text and the bubbles, you know, this sort of format uh, necessarily has to be uh, limited, is uh, McLeod's point here. You could separate the medium from the message or the... Uh, you can have comics about anything, you know, again, uh, there's a comic called Mouse, M-A-U-S, for example. And I don't want to spoil the story for you, but it's about very serious, very dark uh, topics. It does use the form of comics, though, but a lot of people consider that mouse. Uh, let's see if I can get a picture of it here for you. A uh, work of uh, literature. Yeah, here it is. Uh, the Complete Mouse by Art Spiegelman. So this is a comic book, but it's considered basically a work of uh, literature at this point, or you know, very sophisticated. It's even taught in college uh, classes all over the all, all, all over the world. So, but, uh, so I think most people probably agree with McLeod. Uh, we don't want to make this mistake of thinking of comics as being only for kids. And you know, he'll talk about this a little bit later. But you know, it's just so funny. Uh, you know, if you know anybody who's you know been to other been to other countries, especially Japan, uh, the attitude there about comics, or they have different words. They don't call them comics, obviously. Uh, but it's really fascinating how the uh, you know people associate comics here with kids a lot being simple and just action based, <laughs> whereas there it's like this whole huge amazing cultural phenomenon. Uh, it's it's very enlightening uh, to study that. Maybe we'll talk about it later on uh, in this class. But but anyway, just for now, uh, the point is comics aren't just for kids, and you can do a lot with this medium. Uh, then uh, McLeod goes on to try to define uh, comics. He says he's got a fairly dictionary-like definition here. Uh, plural and form used with a singular verb. Okay. Juxtaposed pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence intended to convey information and or to produce an aesthetic response in the viewer. Uh, seems like a pretty airtight definition to me. It's kind of fun watching him you know, sort of struggle to come up with a definition to encompass everything. Uh, but again, this is a very academic thing McLeod is doing here. If you read uh, uh, Socrates or Aristotle, you know, the sort of classic works of philosophy, of course, they always start by saying, what do we mean by, you know, what is this thing we're studying? Uh, let's see if we can define it, see what's included under the category and what's not included. Uh, so that kind of brings us into the history of comics if you will. I mean, nobody would look at this and I uh, think this is a tomb painting, right? A painting on a, the tomb of a of an ancient Egyptian scribe over, you know, I guess uh, 32 centuries ago. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of fun. You know, I don't know how carefully you looked at this page, but he shows you here that you, when you look at this, uh, when you look at this thing, this this work of art, or this painting, I suppose, uh, the way it works is you start over here, and you go over here like that, which kind of opens your eye to the idea that 
you know, just because we read comics a certain way, we read books a certain way, left to right, that's not how it's done everywhere. You know, depending on where you grow up, uh, the culture there, the way literacy works might be the, the opposite of that. Uh, but I thought this was this was really awesome, the way he tells that story of how these uh, ancient Egyptian paintings are basically working like not too dissimilar to comics. He's got a couple of other um, examples he points out. Uh, I thought one was interesting, the stained glass windows. Uh, so I don't know how familiar you are with this, but if you go to certain churches, uh, especially big you know, cathedrals, that sort of thing where there's stained glass uh, windows, if you look carefully at those, you'll see it, well, it's, it looks beautiful, it's a nice work of art, uh, but they actually tell stories. And he doesn't really go into that here, but I've just researched this a little bit elsewhere. And one of the reasons they have these in churches is that, especially during the Middle Ages, uh, not everybody could read. You know, very few people actually were literate, and these uh, 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 these windows were actually helpful. <laughs> it's like you know, here's what's going on in those those scriptures, right? And you could it was sort of illustrations uh, to help people follow, uh, you know, the message of the uh, relig the religious story. Uh, so that's an example you probably would never ever think those were sort of working like comics but you know when you think about it you know it does according to his definition again these juxtaposed or images juxtaposed just means side by side uh and they're pictorial sequences or pictures and they're they're telling a story right and they at least in the case of these uh, uh stained glass windows i mean they definitely provoke an aesthetic <laughs> response you're, a lot of times you're just you're just uh, jaw-droppingly beautiful things you know especially on a on a sunny day uh, but also they're used uh, not just for, uh, you know, in those ancient times, we see them used in technical writing, business writing, uh, whatever you want to call this. Uh, if you uh, fly on an airplane ever, you know, they have these pamphlets uh, in the back of the seat. You pull them up and there'll be a, uh, something like this. And you can see one, two, three, four. So again, it's, they're side by side. There's pictures. It's not really a story, but it is showing you, uh, I guess, something that happens. I guess kind of a story kind of a narrative, I suppose, if we want to stretch that definition a little bit. Uh, but you see how this is working. And I'll just give one other example of this quickly. Uh, a lot of textbooks, college textbooks, books just for fun, trade books, they call those, are being written in the form of comics. And this is one that came out not too long ago. It's very, very popular. And I actually know some of these authors. <laughs> Uh, but they, they basically wrote a textbook for a class like English 191, rhetoric in, or composition or rhetoric. And if you scroll down into it, you notice they are using McLeod uh, for inspiration. Let's get to the, yeah, here we go. Uh, so it's very much like reading Scott McLeod. They sort of borrowed his uh, format, his ideas, but instead of teaching you about comics, they're teaching you about, you know, First, your composition, uh, how to write a good rhetorical argument. And so I just think this, this is a really good book. Again, it's, it's a lot of fun uh, just to read that, but it also is good. It's a good example of how they're using comics for more than just, uh, you know, kid stuff. And just one more point on this. Well, I guess that's the end of my <laughs> lecture. Uh, just one more point on this is that they are using uh, comics more and more for movies. And so it's always struck me that some people complain about it like it's a bad thing, but you know, just think about all of the movies, all of the Marvel, just the Marvel universe alone. Think about how many movies have been, you know, set based on these Marvel comics, the X-Men series, and of course, uh, The Walking Dead. And, and what's really cool about it, you might wonder, why is that? Why do we keep uh, making all these movies and shows based on comics. And, and I think, just, just my theory, is uh, one of the reasons for that, again, I'll see if I can get a, a, a picture here to show you. Um, there is something called storyboarding uh, that happens. Here's one. Might be a little bit hard to see uh, some of these, but uh, basically what happens in TV and film production, uh, a lot of times before they'll commit to building sets and costumes and, and all of that to kind of get a big picture view of, of the movie or the script uh, 
they will make uh, what they call a storyboard and kind of lay out. It's not going to be like second to second, frame to frame, or anything like that. But they try to get this almost like a comic book representation of uh, uh, what's going to happen in that film. And they do the same thing with with games, by the way. Uh, it's just kind of a way to, you know, figure out how something is going to to work on screen. Again, it's a lot cheaper to make a drawing like this <laughs> uh, than it would to actually make some kind of computer model or, uh, you know, of course, actually uh, build a set. And so I think this is kind of one of the reasons why you, you do see so many movies uh, based on comics is that it's basically already in storyboard format, if you think about it. Uh, so they can look at the comic book pages and that gives them a pretty good idea of how, the, how it would look on screen and it makes it a lot easier uh, than, say, trying to... Uh, do the same thing for a novel. So if you just were reading Harry Potter books, you know, there's a lot that you have to uh, come up with, basically, uh, artistic-wise, because it, there has to be visuals, you know, for a movie uh, that you don't, you don't need for a book. <laughs> and so anyway, just that's my little theory. It just kind of makes it easier uh, for these producers to look through a comic. And, and of course, I have a, a handy example here. And uh, you've probably seen the movie 300. Uh, that started as a comic book uh, by Frank Miller and you can see this one is pretty cool because it's so massive it's like really long book but <laughs> you know if you flip through this you can see where they you know got a lot of inspiration for the little look and the look and aesthetics of that film uh, so anyway I think that'll do it uh, about 15 minutes long hope that wasn't too uh, too much for you um, I would like to know again uh, if you have any questions comments you know what you think about McLeod so far I'd love to read that and see you next time.